All right, Zayden, so why don't we go ahead and start? Are you ready? Nice. There we go. All right. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts. Uh, may they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, um, today's, today's class could probably be um, the game changer for you uh, in the sense that... Um, we're going to get into areas that begin to, to, to say, why do some denominations see things differently? And we're going to begin to hit that today. And so I want to say right from the get-go, my goal is not to wage war on some other denominations. My goal is to explain why we believe what we believe. Okay? Secondly is that if someone believes in Jesus Christ, they're going to be in heaven no matter what we disagree with about other things, right? So, I, but in order to understand certain things that we do, we have to understand this issue of faith. And it, it seems strange, but once I, we talk about what faith is and how do we get it, all of a sudden you'll begin to see why certain denominations may do something different with something like baptism and others may not how certain denominations or, or, or belief systems might do something different with the Lord's Supper and might not okay so so this one's critical this is this is this one is critical and I'm doing it right off of what we've done right so we talked about the fact that we are saved we are saved because because of what Jesus did I always want this diagram in your mind that there is this gap between us and God. It doesn't matter who you are in the whole world. Every religion on the planet understands that we got this gap between us and God. The question is, how do we bridge the gap? Does that make sense? I mean, I don't think there's a human being on the planet, even if they're an atheist, that doesn't realize they're an idiot. Because they don't do what they say they're going to do. We're hypocrites in our own heads. We're hypocrites, right? I mean, the fact is, if we're honest, we can't even control our own behavior. We can't even control our own thinking. We can't, we're not even honest about it to ourselves. And if there is a God, well, then we're certainly not honest to him, right? And so the question is, how is that, how do we, how do we bridge the gap? And Christianity uniquely says, you can't bridge the gap. It's absolutely impossible. No matter how hard you try, there is no way you can bridge the gap because God demands perfection, and you'll never be that. He expects that you're going to love him with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul, all the time, every moment of your existence. And the fact is, is that love for self gets in the way. Love for other stuff gets in the way. Before you know it, we're tumbling down and we're missing the mark. Coming out of Christmas, the angels say, Behold, today in the city of David, a Savior has been born. Could have said king, that'd be true. Could have said prophet, that's true. One of the, sometimes when you, when you listen to the Bible, ask yourself the question, why did you use that phrase when you could have used 15 others? Savior. We're going to be talking about this Sunday. John the Baptist twice says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, John could have used my cousin. He could have used, he could have used all sorts of things. Why Lamb of God? Because he sacrificed himself as a lamb on that cross and he died. He bore our stuff and gave us his righteousness. 
How do we get right with God? The only way to get right with God is to be righted, that God has to do it, that somebody has to bridge that gap for me, and that's Jesus. The expectation is, and the, me- and the message of the gospel is, the good news, right? The word gospel means good news. The good news is, you are saved. Do you know where a lot of Christians get it wrong? You can be saved. If you just do this, then you could be saved. The actual message is, you are saved. I need you to believe it. You are saved. Jesus died for all humanity's sins. They're forgiven. It's as if I put a million dollars in your bank. You are technically a millionaire. But unless you go to the bank and see it and start using it and believe it, you're, that you could say, Tom, you're just kidding me, and never tap into that resource. That's probably not a great example, but that's kind of the point that I'm trying to get is that so, so Jesus sends us out to go make believers and followers and disciples of Jesus people who are going to believe a message that God has already saved us. So the question then is, what is faith? Who can have faith? How does one acquire faith? How do you get it? In John chapter 3, Jesus is having a, a description, or having a description, having a conversation with Nicodemus. And I probably, as I'm, I'm looking at passages, I'm going to write them over here on the side just so. Um, John chapter 3. Nicodemus in chapter 3 comes to Jesus in the, at night. And Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's what? Born again. So Jesus himself describes this process as born again. Nicodemus says in verse 4, how can a man be born when he's old? What do you want me to do, enter into my mother's womb a second time? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the what? And the Spirit. No one should talk about faith without taking Jesus' words first. This is early in his ministry. He's being questioned by a Pharisee. And Jesus is saying, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You cannot be a recipient of this unless you are born again. That somewhere being born again is the beginning of faith. Now, faith can be strengthened. It can be nurtured. Jesus tells us if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move, and it moves, right? So the fact is, faith in our lives is, is probably more like a roller coaster. It's not a constant. There are, there are days when our, when our faith is like holding on to a thread. And then there's other times like it's an anchor, and we're just so, we're so certain no one could shake us, right? It's not the amount of faith we have. It's that whether faith is there. And faith is there by being born again. That you must be born of water and the Spirit. Water being the birth of the womb. Spirit being a spiritual rebirth. No, not, 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 not at this point, but it's gonna, we're going to talk about baptism in a sec. Nicodemus, why shouldn't you be surprised by this? Because Nicodemus knows Ezekiel 37. The, 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 the dry bones. You all familiar with that? 
The prophet Ezekiel is taken to a high mountain and he looks down on the bottom of a valley and the bottom of the valley are all these dead bones. And the angel says to Ezekiel, hey, son of man, can these bones live? Only you know. I mean, right? I mean, it's like, no. It's interesting. It's interesting. Ezekiel 37, he is told to do two things. The first time he is told to speak the word. Speak the word to the bones. Tell the bones to come to life. And all of a sudden, all these scattered bones start shifting and rattling and moving. Before you know it, they're no longer scattered dry bones, but they're all dead skeletons. He says to the angel, there's no life in them. We spoke the word and a whole bunch of stuff happened, but there's no life in it. And he says, call for the spirit to come from the four winds and breathe into them and they will have life. And so he calls on the spirit. The spirit comes down, breathes into these bodies, and they now have life. And it says they become a vast army. How did they come to life? God's word and the spirit of God. Those two things combined did the work that caused a bunch of scattered bones to become beings that are now alive again. Nicodemus, you knew this. You knew this. This is how it happens. I want you to go to John chapter 1. And I want you to look at an interesting section that a lot of people uh, miss. If you go to John chapter 1 and go to verse 10, this is the one, this, John chapter 1 is when he says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, that Word was the light that came, you know. He says in verse 10, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So even though he was there, and he was who he says he was, the world didn't recognize him. He says he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, the Jewish nation. Listen to the verse 12 and 13. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, there it is, faith, right? To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And now notice what he says. Children born... Notice the word born. But then he says a negative. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of what? Lock onto that. Lock onto that. All of a sudden, John is saying that when you take God's word... And we know the Spirit of God lives in that Word because He makes it live and active, right? The, the Scriptures are, are, are alive and active. So when, when those two things are combined, they can make one born again. It is not human will. It's not the will of a father. It's not a human decision. Right. It's not those things. But it's the will of God. Born of God. So let's step back a minute and let's go to the beginning of time. Go to the beginning of God creating Adam and Eve. Did Adam and Eve have a choice? To be born? No. God created them. Created them in his image. And gave them the very spirit that could live out and love God with their whole heart, whole mind, whole soul, and love their neighbors and self. The only thing you can do is reject faith, you, right? God is the giver of faith, but we, are the, we can be the rejectors of it. it. We clearly see it. But we also can 
go to Samson and find out that he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. So he was going to be a Nazarite. You can't, don't, don't, don't shave his hair, don't let him have alcohol, all these, all these things, because I've already chosen him. Why are these two, these two babies, why are they wrestling inside of me? Because you've got two nations inside of you. And God chooses Jacob and not Esau to be the lineage. Throughout scripture, you have God choosing the children of Israel to be his, his prime nation. That when God calls, when God moves, things happen. So one of the things that we have to ask is when we talk about faith and its creation, which direction is the movement? The movement is downward. God is calling me. The dead bones did not say, hey, would you please make me alive? God made them alive. Now it's their job to believe that, live that, or reject it. But the fact is, there it is. Are you with me? It appears in Scripture that you have the ability to reject faith but you don't create it. God creates faith. Right? The Bible says that the natural man cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness to him. He does not understand them because they're spiritually appraised. Paul says that, that no one can say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. We already said it's not human decision. It's not a father's will. It's not a human will. It's not, it's not, it's not something we create. It's born again. Or else Jesus would have used a different phrase. When he says born again, he's trying to refer to the fact that when you were born, you didn't get a choice. Yes? So if Jesus or God picked, picked us to, to have faith and to be able to believe in faith, mm -hmm. why would the only people have faith? No, no, no. You're asking a good question, right? And, and, and I, I, can't, I can't answer all of that now because that's going to be a different class. But you're asking a key question. If God's the picker, in the sense of chooser, if he's the creator of faith, then why do some people have faith and others don't, right? And, and how, do you, how do you make that all fit together with uh, the Bible verse that says, God wills all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, right? And, and so when we start to hear Jesus talking about the kingdom of God, he talks about a sower sowing seed. The seed's sown everywhere. Good ground, bad ground, it's sown everywhere. But it only grows on good ground. On the other ground, birds come and eat up the seed. Things happen. They get choked up in life. It seems like what Jesus is saying is everybody gets this opportunity. But listen, there are some of you who are not going to reject me. You're, you're, you're not going to receive me even though I am the very creator of the world. You're going to live in your own sinful nature and you're going to reject me because you're going to think you're the God of the, your own universe. And so it seems to be, and I'm going to get to this more, is that we are recipients of grace and faith, but we also can be the rejecter of it. Because God will let us, I mean, if, if we reject it, we reject it. But, what, what, but I want to do that more, more of what you're asking in another class when we talk about uh, choosing. So here's the difference. What if I told you that there are Christians who think it goes that way? I have to make a choice. I have to decide. I have to decide. I have to come to faith. I have to, right? So, so, so they, the, the, very, the very idea of choice is critical. This view is called chosen. Choice, chosen.
Genesis 17, God says to Abram, before he even changes his name, that I'm going to make you a great nation, but I also am going to covenant with you. What's a covenant? It's a, it's a promise relationship. I'm going to covenant with you. Your sign of the covenant is that you're going to circumcise your children. On the eighth day, you're going to circumcise them. And I will see those children as part of my covenant. But if your children are not circumcised, they're outside of my covenant. Do you notice that there wasn't one moment where Abraham said, don't you want to wait for my kid to decide? The idea was, God's a sovereign God working his work. It's a downward movement. If salvation is his work, I'm the recipient. I'm not the giver of something. I'm not the creator of faith. I'm the recipient of it. It's then something that gets incorporated in my new creation, my new being, my new nature, and it's something I live out or don't. I can reject it. But the point is, from the very first covenant with Abraham, you have God choosing Abraham and then God choosing his children and God saying they're part of my covenant when they're circumcised. Do you remember that Moses almost died because he didn't have his son circumcised? His wife had to do the circumcision and got mad at him and he ended up living. But the point was is he was going back to Egypt to do what he was called to do and he, he almost died. Because his sons weren't circumcised. How did the Jews for 2,500 years understand God? That he was a chooser. He was a, he was a God who, who, who did stuff. He chose Abraham. He chose Jacob over Esau. He chose David. No one said, wait, 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 wait I got to choose. <laughs> they all understood God's a sovereign God who's doing this stuff. He's choosing. He's, he's moving. And we're recipients of his grace and mercy. Called to live out the faith that he has given us. So this, this understanding, theologically, just so you have some terms... This understanding is called monergism. And this is called synergism. You, you, you cut the words in half. One worker. Two workers. This idea is God comes to me and calls me by name and makes me his child. God makes me born again. I'm dead bones in a bo bottom of a valley. He breathes into me at 17 years old and says, you're mine. This view says that God did this work, but I have to get to understand it and accept it. And, 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 and so there's this, this mixture of two workers, one offering a gift. You've probably heard it this way. That the, it's a misuse of the text in Revelation about, I stand at the door and knock. If you open it, I'll enter in. So my part is doing all the work getting to the door, but you've got to open it. Right? The verse does say that, but it's not talking about salvation. He's talking about the church. He's not talking about unbelievers. Notice, go back to Ezekiel 37. How do they ask? They're dead. So from our class last time, we talked about the fact that by nature, we're spiritually blind, dead enemies of God. Right? 
So I want you to picture the biblical description of you and me born into this world sinful is that we're dead, right? So just in your imagination, we're, we're all, there's a casket here, and we're looking inside, and it's us. It's me, you, whatever. There you are, dead. You're not just dead. You're blind dead. I mean, you're not just dead. You're so dead, you're blind too. So now, now you've got to put something over your dead eyes. Now you've got to put boxing gloves on your hands because you are actually by nature an enemy of the very God who wants to redeem and save you. That if you could do anything, you would be a rejecter of him. Spiritually blind, dead, and enemy. How does someone who's blind, dead, and an enemy of God come to faith in Jesus Christ? He's got to be undead, unblind, and unenemy. How can he do that? He can't. He must be born again. See it? See it? So all of a sudden, it wasn't crazy for a Jewish person to say, if God wants to covenant with my kid, God covenants with my kid. He's God. He gets to set the rules. And he's a God of grace. My kid needs it. My kid's a sinful human being that needs grace anyways, right? And so, and so I want you to begin to see that that is the relationship of grace throughout the whole Old Testament. So with that, we begin to talk about, for instance, something like baptism. If God is the worker of grace, and if God is the caller of grace, and a God from, ever since Genesis has been the creator and caller of grace, then who's it for? Everyone. There's not a single verse in Scripture that says, wait until they're 13. Not one. Circumcision was at eight days. It was done to a child. The child didn't ask for it. It wasn't. You imagine if God's covenant of grace existed and you could get your kid into it. God's calling. I've done this work. Here's how it's received. And here's one of those ways, right? So when we get to a topic of baptism, I think one of the first things you need to realize is, that, and you've seen it, we baptize kids. Why? Because as far as I can tell, God never stopped covenanting with them. He's been covenanting with children since, since like forever. And nowhere did he say stop. But he did change how. Clearly, Paul says that you are now circumcised, not with the circumcision done with the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ in your baptisms. That baptism seems to be the entry point into the covenant relationship. So I was having this conversation with someone recently, and it was like an aha experience. Did Jews only circumcise children? No. If someone came to faith in the Jewish religion, they circumcised him and their family. Abraham even had to do his servants, everyone in the household. So my point is, God saw that it was a way of an entry point for the youngest of human beings, as well as an entry point for the oldest of human beings, the oldest being, they would come to faith like the dry bones and say, hey, I want to I wanna enter into this faith and, 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 and I want to be baptized in it. This is like that, that eunuch in Acts chapter 22 that, that hears the word of God and he says, hey, what stops me from being baptized? 
right? In Acts 22, it says, let's, let's, let's do this thing and wash away your sins. There's numerous verses that say those who are baptized in Christ have been put on Christ. That baptism washes away sin. Well, that's what we all need. Is sins washed away. We need Jesus. We need his blood washing away sins. And what if things have never changed? What if God has always covenanted with children and will covenant with children until the day they die? Or until the world ends? And so we're not doing anything inconsistent. This Sunday, we're going to baptize a man. Who's, who, 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 has, who has been touched by the word of God, he's come to faith, and now he wants to be baptized in it. It's the same thing a Jew would do if somebody became a believer in Judaism. Yes, sir. Ah, we assume that God is always calling and we scatter seeds everywhere. We share with anyone and everyone that we can, trusting that God's going to work, right? So, so let's say mom or dad or even yourself, you're sharing with someone and all of a sudden the Spirit of God touches that heart in front of you and they're going, I get it. I want that. I want that for my whole family. What you do is you, you make sure the person has faith. You get them baptized. They get their kids baptized. Before you know it, you got a family in church worshiping, and now you've, they're in the kingdom. It's not for us to decide who might, who what. Let, no, no, no. Just go. Assume that he wills all men to be saved and let God be God. We're just heralds of a message that God has redeemed and saved you. It's not our job to figure out who, what, why, when. It's God's job. Right? He never tells us to pick and choose. He tells us to go because he wills every man to be saved. And we're supposed to preach the gospel till he returns again. Uh, be careful of the word chosen theologically. <laughs> so be careful. God wills all men to be saved. That's a true passage. True, true, true. So what happens is, obviously, for those people who say, for those people who say that, you churches that would say that you don't baptize children it's because this isn't happening they need somehow this choice baby can't make a choice but I would tell you babies never made a choice you didn't make a choice when you were born you don't make a choice in your second born see where where did we get this idea it came out of the age of enlightenment where man's reason had to answer everything What's that? Go ahead. And in the Luke passage, these little ones who believe in me, and in the Luke passage, the Greek is brephe, suckling infants. He's holding suckling infants in his hands, babies who are still nursing. And he's saying, do not hinder these kids who belong to the kingdom of God, who already believe in me, and in another passage, their angels see the throne of God. Jesus is saying a whole lot about born again, about who has it, who, who, should, who gets it, who receives it. And so one of the things that I just, I, I try to tell people, we didn't change anything. Even in the book of Acts, it says that whole, family, whole families were baptized. Matter of fact, there's no verse that says stop. Can you imagine a people doing something for 2,500 years? If God's going to change something for a people that have done something for 2,500 years, he's going to be really clear. Stop doing that from now on. Do it this way. There's not a single verse that says that. Do we think that just adults went to the waters of the Jordan River and were baptized by John? Uh, 
I bet you they were dragging their whole families. I bet you they were dragging their whole families because it was always your whole family. God, God was, God, man, I'm repenting. The whole family's repenting. Let's go, right? But it all depends. If you need this synergistic choice that man has to choose, then babe, baptizing a baby makes no sense in the world. But if God is the one who breathes into those dead bones and makes them alive, he can do that to my grandchild that was just baptized. He can do it to my grandfather at 84 when he died on his deathbed. No difference. My grandfather at 84 was dead or as dead can be. Holy Spirit just grabbed him on his deathbed. Crazy. In front of my eyes. My grandfather came to faith in front of my eyes and then died. Didn't have to. Didn't no no there was no time. But but no, I mean it, it was just it was because faith is what's essential, right? I mean the thief on the cross wasn't baptized, but today you'll be with me in heaven. So we've got to be careful of the things we make rituals about. Faith is the thing but doesn't it make sense that our sinful human reason would make it about us? Doesn't it make sense? We should always avoid if we're back to the center of things. If we're back to the center of things and not God, we should always question our theology. But we don't like it when God says it's not about you. It's about me. Adam and Eve didn't like it. Cain didn't like it. We just don't like it. So some of the questions that, 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 that need to be asked when you talk about baptism is that we, we believe that baptism is a sacrament. And, and every, every time you hear that word, people say Catholic. I say Christian. There's lots of there's denominations that are not Catholic that also see it as a sacrament. The definition of a sacrament, three things. God says to do it. There's external means, physical means, and that it offers forgiveness of sins. Well, baptism washes away sin, waters the external means, and Jesus says, do it. In the Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples of what? All nations. All nations, including everyone. How? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? Into my very being, into my very presence, into all the power and grace and authority, baptize them into that. And then teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. They got to grow up in it. They got to, you got to, you got to, you got to teach them. A Jewish person didn't circumcise their kid and go, okay, we're good. Now we're going to talk to you about why you're circumcised and why you have this faith and why we practice what we practice and why we do what we do and what, right? And so then that child grows up and that, that now that faith is strengthened, nurtured, and that child then hands that faith down to their children and just, right? So if we begin to see simply that God has performed this work of salvation and we're dead bones needing to be revived. We need to be born again, as Jesus says. Not by our own human will or human decision, but God's got to do something. He's got to spark this life in me. Well, then he can spark that in anybody at any age. And then I want to talk about some dangers. Built into this choice is the word reason. Decision. I make a decision to move, to buy a house, to get married. I'm making these choices, these decisions. I'm rationally making decisions. Well, pretty soon, then that could become a work. Theologically. Look what I did. If it's a work, then how do you know you did it well enough? How do you know you chose sufficiently enough? Pure enough, right enough. 
If you get Alzheimer's and can't reason yourself out of a bag, do you still have faith? Do you still have faith when you're asleep and you're, and you're unconscious? See, faith has to be more than reason. Although my reason knows that Jesus was around 33 years old when he started his ministry, he did it for three years, he was in Judea. I, I, I have cognitive knowledge about history and the time, but none of that saves me. Something else saves me. Thief on the cross didn't have any of that stuff, that knowledge, right? I mean, just stop everything. I mean, I'm, seriously, we're, at, we're, we're there at the crucifixion, and we're listening to the story. And we're, I mean, listen to the whole thing. And the thief on the cross is saying, hey, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise, Okay? Slide in the little movie thing and go, <laughs> stop. Hey, thief on the cross, can you explain the Trinity? How about the two natures of Jesus? How about baptism? How about everything that's happening here? Do you even know what vicarious atonement is? Do you really... Why is that guy getting to heaven? He doesn't have enough knowledge about Jesus to work himself out of a bag. Something happened to that guy on the inside that we don't even see, but Jesus did. You know how many times Jesus said to religious people, I hear what you're saying, but your hearts are far from me. Nicodemus, how do you not know these things? How can you be a teacher of Israel and not know these things? How can you claim to be an authority of my word and you don't even understand the word? Oh, you must not be born again. Nicodemus, you know if you're not born again, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know Nicodemus is scrolling through the, the scriptures trying to figure out what's he talking about, born again? Because the whole religious thing is about what I do, what I know, how much I know. Pharisees knew more than Sadducees, and Sadducees knew more than everybody else, and you all sucked because you weren't one of us. And, and the whole system was related, related on, relied on knowledge and insight and all this kind of stuff that was dead ritual. Right. And so then you begin to realize, as we've talked about, that, that the scriptures have two words for knowledge. The Greeks had two words, oida and gnosko. Oida was knowing that two plus two is four. That Americans drive on the right side of the lane, of the street. That we know that, that, that Oxford is 45 miles north of Detroit. You knowing that information does do nothing for your life. Not your spiritual salvation. Gnosko is knowing a truth so deeply that it changes who you are. It changes you. Your whole life now gets shifted because of that truth. So that's what happened inside the thief on the cross. That only can happen if Something dead is made alive. Dead bones coming to life. Lazarus. Mary and Martha, Lazarus, all great friends of Jesus. Jesus would stop and stay at their house all the time. How do you like this? You're Mary and Martha. Lazarus gets sick and you do the right thing. You say, go find Jesus. Like how many of us don't try to fix it ourselves? Flail to fix it ourselves. We they, they're smart enough to know, go get Jesus. 
He can fix anything. And Jesus waits. And Lazarus dies. And then Jesus shows up. Mary, remember Mary, who sat at the feet of Jesus when Martha was all busy getting stuff ready? She won't even come out of the house to see him. They have to send for her. She's so mad. I get it. How many of us haven't asked God to do something and he didn't do what we thought he was going to do? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This would be like you and I going to a funeral, which I do all the time, and say, not dead. Not dead. See, that's what makes Christianity different. Jesus says, take me to the tomb. He goes out there, tells them to roll away the stone. They have no idea what he's doing. Jesus, that doesn't make any sense. You're, you're, you're going to make a fool of yourself. The stench, it's all... Not. Okay, we absorb this objective truth. You're the resurrection and the life. They oided it. Right? How many scripture verses have you oided because you know they sound right, but you haven't gnoscoed? All of a sudden, Lazarus come out and your brother, your loved one, is alive. You won't change your life? That's the day. That's the day. Not because of either any of them. The Bible says that he did it so that they might see the glory of God. How this works. I'm the doer. I'm the doer. I have the authority. I have the power. I'm the resurrection and the life. Introduce people to me. That's what we do. That's what I preach if I'm doing it the right way. That's what we do if we're talking to a friend or someone who's struggling. I just need to introduce you to Jesus. Because somewhere between Oida and Gignosco, everything changes. Because when you meet the resurrected Jesus, it's beyond reason. Tell me that anybody the day Jesus showed up said, Hey, I, I think he's going to raise Lazarus. That's what he's going to do. No one. Not a single person expected that's what he was going to do. That's how God works. We all have our own stories of how God encountered us, how God... Uh, did my dad know that I was going to come to Christ at 17 because he was going to make sure that my butt wasn't bust in Detroit and he's going to force me to go to a, a Christian school? No. He was just satisfying his frustration and anger with, with society and with government. And, 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 and But what happened was I met Jesus there. Born again. The Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, he was what? He was Saul, and he was murdering and killing Christians and ruining their lives. Anywhere in Scripture do you see, anywhere in Scripture do you see this theological zealot who is trying to wipe Christianity off the map, do you see anywhere where God says, hey, I want to introduce myself so you'll receive me, so you'll accept me? No. God knocks him off a horse, blinds him, the Holy Spirit fills him, and his whole life is changed. 
Where was Paul's choice? Where was that adult man's choice? See, that's a failure in our whole thinking that even as an adult, my grandfather did not say, oh, hey, I finally put two plus two together. He oided to Gnosko. He rejected everything I ever told him. Then all of a sudden, coming out of a coma, says, Tommy, tell me about Jesus. I'll see you there. How do you do that? He wasn't even supposed to be awake. God did something inside my grandfather that is not explainable. What if that's how it always works? So, so, so this is, I, I just want you to see that how one looks at this, what is faith? And I would say that faith must be always has to have a supernatural connotation. It's beyond reason. It's not like grabbing a textbook and say, now I understand calculus. It is being encountered by the living God who changes your whole perspective. He changes you from the inside out. Born again. There was one day when Paul hated Christians. There's another day he wakes up and he is one. Not a whole lot of choice. A whole lot of born againing. And now with that same zeal, he goes out into the world getting beat up, shipwrecked, stoned, flogged. What kind of idiot would do that for information that he knew? He did it because it was him. To deny his faith would be to deny himself. Something changed in him. So faith has to be more than reason, or, or, or when I have Alzheimer's, do I have to risk not having faith? Because I can no longer oida it. When I was a pastor uh, in Cleveland, my very f first church, there was a family who had a, a disabled girl, um, and I don't know exactly, can't remember now what it was she had, um, but at the end of church, it was our tradition to stand at the end of the aisle and shake hands with people. And the parents were just amazed that every time they came out, she would reach for me. Because she didn't reach out to anybody. And I had, that's the days when I wore robes and stoles and crosses and all sorts of stuff. And that girl would take my cross and she would put it in my face and put it in front of her face and put it in front of my face and put it in front of her face and put it in front of my face every time. Same thing. Yes. But she had no ability to. Not if reason is the goal. She did not have the reasonable ability to, 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 to understand the concepts. Most compelling argument for me is one, we're all born in sin, so we all need it. But I made a big deal about this a couple weeks ago. I want you to think about this. And this also speaks to all the life issues, I think. The first person to recognize Jesus for who he was was a fetus named John the Baptist. The Bible says that John the Baptist would be filled with the Spirit from the moment of his conception. He's six months in the womb and he leaps simply because Jesus, who was just conceived, walked in the room inside of Mary. To every Christian on the planet, I want to stop and say, what's your view on when life begins? But more than that, how could John have faith? He doesn't have the brain capacity to comprehend anything. He's only six months in the womb. The development of all the stuff that you and I would call necessary to understand stuff isn't there. 
But nevertheless, he leaps in the womb, and so much so the Spirit of God fills Elizabeth, and she starts prophesying. Before you know it, Mary's filled with the Spirit. She's prophesying all because two kids in wombs met each other. John the Baptist was chosen to be the forerunner of Jesus before he was even born. No choices, no decisions for him. God chose him. And nobody argues with it. But if I say he chose you, you go, wait a minute, I didn't choose. What about my choice? It's, it's interesting how the, our nature, our reasonable nature wants to argue with something that seems to be so prevalent. So when you think of this downward movement, I want you to think about all the time that we're, we're receiving, not giving. Why is that important? Because there are, there are denominations that will say that baptism is I'm doing something for God. When I take the Lord's Supper, I'm doing something for God. When is that ever the case? God doesn't need anything. We are always broken, simple human beings that need His grace and His forgiveness. We're recipients. So when we look at baptism or the Lord's Supper, we see ourselves as recipients of something. Not givers of something. Shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Baptize, washing away sins. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. All the people in Acts chapter 2, Peter, what should we do? Repent of your sins and be baptized, you and your families, you and your households. The, Acts chapter 2, it's, it's, the, right, it's Pentecost. It is Pentecost. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive what? The Holy Spirit. What did Peter know? Repent of sin, and that baptism washes away sin, and the Holy Spirit's involved. He knew immediately. And then he goes on to say, this promise is for you and for your children. That's what every good Jew would say. It's always. It's always. All right. So I'll stop there. I've done 100% of the talking. But this is going to set up everything we're going to talk about. So when we start talking about the Ten Commandments, when we start talking about baptism, Lord's Supper, when we start talking about, about um, Christian works, everything flows from an idea that we're a recipient of God's grace. Why? Why? Why do you go to church? Why do you go to worship? If your kid says to you, hey, why do I have to go to church? I know your kids have never said that. Your kids have always said, hey, let's do this thing. But... Let's say, let's say your kid did say, why do we have to do this? What's a parent's normal response? Because I said so or because God says so? What have we just said? In order to make God happy, you've got to do. What if God, Jesus, fulfilled the law so perfectly that I don't have to go to church? I don't have to put money in an offering plate. I don't have to do anything but live in the faith that he's created me in. But once I find out I'm living in that faith, I start giving and going to worship because I need to be there. You see, it changes everything. The why changes. If we just stop saying, because I have to, Jesus did everything for us. There's no work that God expects of us than to live in faith.
But those who live in faith are going to be like branches connected to a vine. They're going to produce fruit. It's just going to be net. Your life's going to change. Paul became a Christian and started doing stuff, started living. It changed. I became a Christian and my life changed. Makes me wonder, how, come, how can I know some Christians that have been Christians for 10, 15 years and their lives never change? How is that possible? When everybody in the Bible changes after they meet God. Maybe you really haven't met God. Right? There were a lot of religious people in Jesus' day who thought they were going... I guarantee you the day that Nicodemus came to see Jesus, he had no question about whether he was going to be in the kingdom. By the way, when did he come to faith? Nicodemus. We'll end there. When did Nicodemus come to faith? Do you guys remember? Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the, the snake in the desert, the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Do you guys remember the story of the snake in the desert in the Old Testament? Anybody not remember that? So in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were screwing up, and God inf affected them with snakes, and they were biting them, and they were dying. Everybody who got bit by a snake died. And so Moses does what he always does. He goes in and prays. And usually when he prays, God says, okay, I forgive you guys. And he doesn't. What he tells them to do is put a bronze serpent on a staff, a this huge pole, put it in the center of the camp. And if anybody gets bit, look at that. What would that require? Do you know how many people probably said, what looking at a stupid bronze serpent is going to save my behind? Oh. Bam, died. <laughs> right? Until, until the first person looks at it and is saved. Now, what does that person do to everyone they love? Oh, what? They do what? How come we're not telling people that we've seen the snake? We've, we've seen Jesus die on a cross for us. We're just letting people around us die. But the point is, Jesus told Nicodemus one last story in the Old Testament of why he should know all this. Just as a snake was raised, the Son of Man's going to be raised. Well, guess where Nicodemus is on Good Friday? He's at the cross with all the religious leaders who voted him to be crucified. He's there. He's one of the Sanhedrin members. He voted. He's the one that tried to talk him out of it, and he got poked by the, 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 the head guy, and, and, and he shut up. But I want you to realize that all those religious leaders are there. The Bible says they're hurling insults at him. If you're really the Christ, come down, blah, blah, blah. They're just... Nicodemus is listening. He's watching. Because now the Son of Man has been lifted up. And he's listening and watching. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Something happens. Something happens. Nicodemus is born again when Jesus died. I mean, at least he should have waited three more days, I always say. <laughs> Make sure he rises again. But he didn't need to. Something happened because the word of God was spoken into his heart and all of a sudden in front of his own eyes, it starts to happen and all of a sudden now all the Old Testament that he knew is getting shifted around and in front of... But the other religious leaders were there and that wasn't happening? He was being born again. He was being born again. All of a sudden he's going, this is real. So much so that he asked to bury Jesus' body, which means he was no longer a member of the Sanhedrin. He was done. His career's over. He did that for a dead guy. He gave up everything for a dead guy. We don't have a record of it. We don't have a record of it. All right.
Any last quick questions before I, we shut off and, and, and we're done? Was that at all helpful? Was that at all help you kind of see uh, theologically where we're at? And, and, and um, are you all good? Everybody's good? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is the truth. It's not just a truth. It is the truth. It is eternal truth. It is a truth so powerful that when spoken, it can take dead things and make them alive. We thank you that your word has spoken into our hearts. We thank you for the born again, the, the rebirth that you have worked in us. And we pray that by your spirit, you would continue to strengthen our faith, grow us in our faith. And yes, grow us even in our knowledge of the truth so that we might not only be confident in our own faith, but be able to share our faith with others. Lord, there's a whole world out there bitten by a snake and they're dying. And we've looked at the cross and been healed. Help us find ways to reach out to friends, family, loved ones, neighbors. Not, not, Lord, just open up doors. Make them come to us with curiosity and questions. Lord, they're your children. You want them saved. You want them redeemed. May your church do what it's supposed to do.